All right, so I want to start with a discussion in genetics and microbiology, and I want to start talking just with a little bit of background information on DNA. So DNA contains information in a sequence of nucleotides. The genetic code is a set of rules by which information that's encoded within genetic material, so the information contained in the genetic material, is translated into proteins. So basically, we use this genetic code to determine, and I'm sure many of you have done this in the past, you've um, gotten a piece of messenger RNA, and you've been asked to find the start codon, which was AUG, and um, figure out what the pro, you know, what the sequence of amino acids is essentially. Okay, so basically, this genetic code is highly similar in all organisms. So, a really important point for we're talking about bacteria is that this is like you might have thought maybe that uh, bacteria had a different, had maybe different bases or something like that, or had a different genetic code, and but that's just not necessarily the truth. Okay, here that's not the truth. So it's similar in all organisms, and you can use a table with 64 entries to determine it, and that table can be found, you know, just a quick Google search. So another important point is all living organisms have double-stranded DNA. Okay, they don't have single-stranded DNA. Uh, this was a point. This was a question I tripped a lot of people up. I, I actually saw this question trip a lot of people up, and uh, I'm not including viruses in this particular discussion because they're not necessarily considered living. Although, if you want to argue the case that they are living, um, it, you know, a, a pretty decent case can be made for that. So the other thing I'm showing here is I have the base pairing, um, and we have four bases: adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. Okay. And this is just my short-term notation for the base pairing that there's two hydrogen bonds that connect A and T and three hydrogen bonds that connect G and C. So uh, you might remember that the more um, GC you have in your in your DNA, uh, the harder it is to be denatured because it's got three hydrogen bonds. Three hydrogen bonds are stronger than two hydrogen bonds, so it kind of makes sense. Um, also, there's a major groove and a minor groove, and that's basically for DNA binding proteins. It's locations for DNA binding proteins to um, attach to the molecule. And um, that can usually be distinguished on a picture of the double helix. You can usually see the slight difference. In, um, but anyway, that's, another, that's a discussion for another time. So all the DNA inside the cell is the genome, and the DNA is usually found in the chromosome and many cells have a plasmid. Um, basically what I'm saying here is that you have this, it, the DNA is usually found in the chromosome and many cells have a plasmid, so I'm saying that that's where the DNA is found, but the plasmid is probably the most important and most interesting point. Um, the plasmid is something kind of unique, and I'm gonna get, go into a full discussion on what that's all about in another minute here. So the chromosome is usually a single circular chromosome, so bacterial chromosomes are usually single circular chromosome, um, but again, it can be linear. It's not always single circular chromosome. Uh, many have multiple chromosomes, so many bacteria have multiple chromosomes, and um, the size of the genome can vary. Basically, it can be pretty small, and then again, it can be fairly large, up to 9.4 million base pairs. So the next slide, I'm gonna be discussing the plasmid. So, Basically, what I wanted to say about the plasmids is that the plasmid is extra chromosomal DNA, okay, and it's usually small double-stranded circles of DNA. So those can be seen on my diagram here. Um, these are the plasmids, and they typically only carry a few genes. Um, and basically, those genes are usually non-essential genes. They'll be non-essential genes. They'll be things that aren't necessarily required for the absolute survival of the cell, okay? Uh, they replicate independently of the chromosome in this case. And it's possible to have many copies of the plasmid. Basically, what I'm saying here is it's possible to have two different types. You can have a low copy number of plasmids. So like this example right here where you see like three plasmids, that's a low copy number of plasmids. Or you can have a high copy number of plasmids. And that could be upwards of 50 in, a, in you know in a single cell. So it depends. Um, plasmids are used in biotechnology all the time. And again, you might ask or be wondering, you know, what kind of genes are on these plasmids? What, what, what do they carry? Well, basically, the plasmid provides bacteria with the ability to survive under certain unfavorable circumstances. So basically, you'll find genes with antibiotic resistance, um, resistance to some toxic metals, um, proteins to metabolize rare food sources. So for instance, like if the normal food source is like glucose, and you need to metabolize lactose, or the bacteria needs to metabolize lactose, because that's all that's available. Um, also, genes that allow for symbiosis. So those are some of the examples. Um, genes may be transferred to members of the same species 
that lack a particular gene or members of other species. Okay, so that's one of the interesting things. We don't just have um, vertical gene transfer, we have also horizontal gene transfer. And I'm going to get into a deep discussion about that in the near future. So the last part I want to talk about here with this kind of basic introduction to in, into um, DNA and talking about bacterial genetics is basically the, the way DNA is packaged to fit inside the bacterial cell. So it's compacted by what's called supercoiling, and it's regulated by what's known as topoisomerase, which is an enzyme, and it compacts DNA into an organized nucleoid. All right, so we know that bacteria don't have a nucleus, but they do have a nuclear region, so to speak. We call it a nucleoid. And type 1 type topoisomerase is basically cleave one strand of DNA and relieve supercoiling. So the type 1 topoisomerase can be shown on the schematic on the right side of this here. This is showing basically a supercoil being unconstrained. So this is your single circular chromosome here, and it's losing the supercoil. Okay. And type 2 is, uh, type 2 topoisomerases are basically considered DNA, what's known as DNA gyrase is another name for it. And they cleave both strands of DNA. And they also use ATP, so they're using energy. They re require some energy to um, introduce these supercoils. And as a general rule, when I talk about supercoiling, um, basically mo mo most organisms have negative are negatively supercoiled. So that's just a, you know, a little point to cap this off. 